Hey guys, it's James here. With Apple wrapping up their M2 chip lineup with M2 Ultra, there are now 8 different Apple Silicon chips and I think 15 different Macs with M series chips you can buy. And they're all really good. So which one should you buy for your music production needs? In this video, I'll present you the ultimate in-depth guide to choosing the right Apple Silicon Mac specifically for audio engineers, music producers, musicians, and the like in 2023 and 2024. I'll be covering all the M1 and M2 chips and providing clear rationale for which chip and what configurations uh, might give you the most return on investment for your use case. I'll show you why the specific doll you use is actually really important when it comes to determining which chip you should choose. Now, my focus will be on cost effectiveness. So if you're rich and just want to get the latest tech, this video is going to be a waste of time for you. But for the rest of you who want to get the most out of what you pay for, you are so in the right place. If you are into the technical stuff like benchmarking and comparative testing specifically for music production, I have a video for M1 Max, one for M2, and another one for M2 Pro. I'll put the links in the description. All my analyses, opinions, and recommendations in this video are made with the assumption that you're using the computer primarily for music production and not for video, gaming, graphic design, uh, coding, or any other categories. And obviously, I can only speak on a general level. Everyone's use case is unique and only you can know your exact needs. Let's get started by examining all the M series chips. There are now two generations of each chip. Now, you may think that second generation means it's better, but that's actually not always the case and you might just be making a big mistake if you assume so. And just like what I said in my last M1 Mac buying guy video, which apparently many of you loved, you can pretty much eliminate the two Max chips and the two Ultra chips if you're uh, buying a Mac primarily for music production work simply because those chips are decked out for video and graphic work but I'll talk more about this later. Despite being the base chip in their uh, respective lineups, both the M1 chip and the M2 chip are very powerful and will offer enough power for a lot of musicians, music producers, and audio engineers. Generally speaking, the M1 and M2 chips are what I would recommend for beginners, amateurs, and hobbyists who are just doing music for fun. I would also recommend these chips for professionals like full-time guitarists, touring musicians, or recording engineers who don't do very CPU-intensive tasks, but want an affordable, fast, and reliable computer with great battery life. The M2 is actually plenty powerful for handling large mixing projects. Just for reference, I was able to run my mixing and mastering studio entirely off an M2 MacBook Air. Like I was literally able to mix large projects up to 200 tracks no problem on a fanless base model M2 MacBook Air, which is insane. So if you want to know more details about that, I highly recommend you uh, to watch that video. If you can find a Mac with the base M1 chip for a good price in the form factor you prefer, aka laptop or desktop, I believe it's generally better to buy that instead of the M2 equivalent because you won't gain much uh, performance-wise for spending extra bucks on the M2 chip. Compared to M1, some of the more major upgrades M2 has are in the video department. For example, M2's media engine now supports not only H.264 and HEVC, but also ProRes and ProRes RAW, which is completely useless for audio. M2 also has two extra GPU cores. Again, not relevant for audio production because audio processing is currently not done on a GPU, at least not yet. Some plugins utilize the GPU for the UI, but that's really it. Both M1 and M2 have A cores, half of them efficiency and the other half performance, except that M2's cores are slightly faster. But for those of you who are doing just fine already with the M1 chip in your Mac mini, iMac, or uh, MacBook Air, there is no need to upgrade to the M2 chip in my opinion. And for those who feel that the M1 chip is bottlenecking their music projects, upgrading to the M2 chip won't really solve your problem. Instead, you should be looking at the Pro chips. Both the M1 and M2 chip will be able to handle multi-track recording, fairly large mixing projects at 44.1 kHz, and running several M-SIMs along with a drum library and a bass guitar library, no problem. If you find this video helpful so far, be sure to give it a like and hit the subscribe button. It will really help out the channel and I would really appreciate it. Now, things get more interesting once we get to the M1 Pro and the M2 Pro chips. 
If you compare the Tanko versions of each, the M2 Pro chip actually has two less performance cores, but two more efficiency cores than the M1 Pro chip. This is an important point to consider because the M2 Pro chip is trading performance for better power efficiency, and that may or may not be beneficial in your specific use case. Note that this difference of two performance cores does make a huge difference in practice. In my M2 Pro MacBook Pro review video, I discovered that Logic Pro X and Ableton Live actually cannot take full advantage of the efficiency cores in the M series chips for some reason. I recently did some more testing on this uh, with not only Logic, Ableton Live, and Reaper, but also Pro Tools and Cubase. So the way I tested this is in each doll, I put a mono guitar DI on a track and put the archetype Nolly Amsim by Neo TSP as an insert. It's set to mono mode and high oversampling. Then I would duplicate a track as many times as possible until either the audio starts to crackle during playback or the DAW gives um, me a system overload message, whichever comes first. This test is really useful because MSIMs are usually very CPU heavy, and when you have multiple tracks with MSIMs, they will try to utilize as many cores as possible, at least ideally. And the number of tracks with MSIMs a DAW can handle will give you a good idea of what kind of performance you can get from that DAW on a specific chip for mixing and mastering. Keep in mind that the 10-core M1 Pro chip actually has the exact same CPU as the one in the M1 Max chip. So the M1 Pro chip and the M1 Max chip are interchangeable in the testing I'm going to show you. In Reaper, both the 10-core M2 Pro and the 10-core M1 Pro give me the exact same performance because Reaper is able to fully utilize all 10 cores in both chips. Doesn't matter if it's a performance core or efficiency core. You can clearly see in the CPU history monitor here that all 10 cores are completely maxed out on both chips. This is the ideal scenario because Reaper is able to utilize all the computing power that's available. This is what I would call a fully optimized stall. Cubase 12 Pro is also pretty optimized for these Apple Silicon chips. You can see that I'm also getting uh, the exact same performance with both chips. As expected, the CPU monitor shows that all 10 cores are maxed out. I'm getting three tracks less compared to Reaper. I don't know why, but my guess is that Cubase just has more features compared to Reaper, so it's requiring a bit more uh, resources to run. But this is still an ideal scenario. Notice how both M1 Pro and M2 Pro performed exactly the same, even though M2 Pro has slightly faster clock speed. This is why I said earlier that going from the base M1 chip to the base M2 chip won't give you any significant boost in performance for audio. Now let's take a look at Pro Tools here. You can see that on both chips, I'm getting way less performance compared to Reaper and Cubase. Only 71 tracks on the M2 Pro chip and 86 tracks on the M1 Pro chip before Pro Tools gives me the system overload pop-up. That's 20 less tracks and 5 less tracks respectively compared to doing the same test in Reaper. Looking at the CPU monitor, we can see why this happens. The 4 efficiency cores in M2 Pro and the 2 efficiency cores in M1 Pro are not used to the max. This explains why M1 Pro performs better than the M2 Pro in Pro Tools because M1 Pro has two more performance cores. Logic Pro X is even less optimized. I can only run 67 tracks on the M2 Pro chip and 79 tracks on the M1 Pro chip. That's 24 less tracks and 12 less tracks compared to running the same test in Reaper. Once again, the CPU monitor explains the story behind it. You can see that the efficiency core's utilization is extremely poor, even worse than Pro Tools. And yes, of course, I have the processing threads set to 10 before I started testing. Ableton Live remains the least optimized among the bunch. It can only run 62 tracks on the M2 Pro chip and 72 tracks on the M1 Pro chip. That's 29 less tracks, or a 38% difference in performance compared to Reaper on M2 Pro, and 19 less tracks, or a 23% difference compared to Reaper on M1 Pro. Looking at the CPU monitors here, you can see that the efficiency cores are completely idling, and even the performance cores aren't used to the max like other DAWs do. But somehow, if I duplicate one more track, the audio will start to crackle already. By this point, I'm sure you already realize how crucial it is to take into account your primary DAW when choosing a chip. If your main DAW is Logic, Ableton Live, or Pro Tools, 
the performance you can get from your doll is directly related to the number of performance cores there are in the chip, but not the total core count. As my tests have shown, the 10-core M1 Pro chip with 8 performance cores will give you better performance than the 10-core M2 Pro chip with only 6 performance cores on these three dolls. So if you need extra CPU power, be sure to get the 12-core M2 Pro chip or at the very least the 10-core M1 Pro chip instead of the 10-core M2 Pro chip. Conversely, if your main doll is Reaper or Cubase, because the doll can utilize all the cores in the CPU, you're getting exactly 10-core performance when you buy a 10-core chip. Needless to say, the 12-core M2 Pro chip will trump the 10-core versions of M1 Pro and M2 Pro, no matter which doll you use. However, the two extra performance cores will cost you $300 US dollars more. Between the 10-core and 12-core versions of the M2 Pro chips, my general advice is to pair the 12-core version with 16 gigabyte of RAM if you do more mixing and mastering than using sample libraries. And pair the 10-core version with 32 gig of RAM if you use loads of sample libraries and mixing and mastering aren't a priority to you. It's all about strategically spending more of your budget on the things you need and less on the things you don't need. Generally speaking, the Max chips and the Ultra chips are complete overkill for music production. These chips are clearly tailored more specifically for high-end video and graphics work. So as a music producer, audio engineer, or musician, you simply won't be able to utilize a significant amount of the computing power you pay for. The Max chips, in particular, do not provide any uh, performance gains for audio processing because they have the exact same CPU as their Pro variants. M2 Max combines the incredible CPU performance of M2 Pro. The M2 Max has the exact same CPU as the 12-core uh, M2 Pro, and the same applies to the M1 Max and the 10-core M1 Pro. For the Max chips, you're really just paying for the extra GPU cores and the extra media engines, which again won't matter if you're just doing audio work. You do get to configure up to double the RAM with the Max chips, but Apple Silicon's RAM costs a lot of money. So I generally say that if you're an advanced composer of some sort and need much more than um, 32 gig of RAM and you don't do much mixing, building yourself a PC will probably get you way further with less money. There is one scenario where getting the M2 Max is a better value than getting the M2 Pro, and that is if you want to get a desktop Mac with 32 gig of RAM and one terabyte of SSD, because a Mac Mini with 12-core M2 Pro, 32 gig of RAM, and one uh, terabyte of SSD actually costs the same as a Mac Studio with M2 Max and the same amount of RAM and SSD. Doesn't make any sense to me, but credit to Zach Seif Music for uh, pointing this out to me. When it comes to the Ultra chips, you get 20 CPU cores with the M1 Ultra and 24 CPU cores with M2 Ultra, basically doubling their max variance. This will make a big difference mostly for audio engineers who mix entirely large projects at 48 kilohertz or higher. You also have the option to get up to 128 gig of RAM with M1 Ultra or 192 gig of RAM with M2 Ultra, which could benefit advanced composers. But even then, no amount of audio processing can fully take advantage of M1 Ultra's 64 GPU cores or M2 Ultra's 76 GPU cores, or any of the extra media engines. RAM upgrades for Apple Silicon Macs are also incredibly expensive because it's actually a unified memory. If you don't know what that is, you can think of it as traditional RAM, but much, much faster for simplicity's sake. But once again, it won't make any difference compared to the much cheaper traditional RAM if you're primarily just loading samples. It's just so much cheaper to build a custom PC for much less money if having a lot of RAM is the most important factor for your use case. This is why I believe the Macs and Ultra chips are extremely cost ineffective for the average audio and music professionals. You're just paying so much for a chip that you can only partially take advantage of. Bottom line is that you really need to be doing both demanding audio work and demanding uh, graphic slash video work to get the best value of the M uh, of the Max and Ultra chips. When it comes to RAM, nothing really changed with the newer M2 lineup. So my analysis and advice are the same as the one from my M1 Mac buying guy video. 
I'm not going to repeat myself here, but essentially, you should carefully assess your RAM needs by opening a project that represents the typical kind of work you do. And then, looking at the RAM usage on your computer. For Windows, is in Task Manager, and for Mac, is in Activity Monitor. However, on Mac, make sure you're looking at the Memory Pressure Monitor instead of Memory Used. This is extremely important because looking at memory used will give you a complete wrong idea of how much RAM you actually need. The reason is that macOS takes advantage of unused or idling RAM as much as possible to give you a better user experience. So even if you aren't doing anything RAM heavy, you might still see that over half of your RAM is in use. But as soon as the user, which is you, needs the RAM, macOS will give you back those RAM. This is actually what Apple says on their official website, so it's not some myth floating around the internet. The memory pressure graph is what macOS uses to tell you whether or not you're running out of RAM. If it's green while you have your projects open, you're good. No need to get more RAM for your new Mac. If it's yellow, you're good still, but I would say if you can afford more RAM in the next Mac you're buying, you should go for it. If the graph is red, it means that your computer is already running out of RAM. So you should definitely configure more RAM on your next Mac. Choosing the right amount of RAM is really as simple as this. No need to overcomplicate it. My general approach to SSD is to get as much as you can afford after you have already identified which chip is best for you and how much RAM you need. The reason is that if you're doing any kind of audio recording on a regular basis, you're going to accumulate a ton of large WAV files. It makes no sense to try to cover all your storage needs with your Mac's internal SSD, which is very expensive to upgrade because it is tailored for tasks that require extremely fast read and write speeds, like editing 8K raw footage. Music production doesn't require SSDs this fast, so it's much more cost efficient to get external HDDs for the majority of your storage needs. Even if you want to stick with all SSDs, it's a lot cheaper to buy external SSDs than to upgrade the SSD in the Mac. So my general advice is to configure enough internal SSD storage to handle all your active projects, apps, and plugins, plus some free space, and don't go higher than that. This way, those active projects are always ready to go, and you can move any completed projects to an external HD or SSD to your archive. 512 gigabyte can usually feel a bit tight if you're a professional and have multiple DAWs with built-in sound libraries installed like Logic and Cubase. So I think one terabyte is a good starting point uh, for most people. That's it for the video. I hope you have a better idea of how to choose your next Mac now. And let me know in the comments which Mac you're planning to buy next. Give this video a like if you find it helpful, and subscribe if you want more in-depth informational content like this on your feed. Have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.